Good morning, everyone. We are starting our CMSA colloquium. Today, we are very happy to have Kevin Bother as our, as our speaker. Kevin is uh, based in Imperial College London. He has a, a long list of achievements. Uh, to me, one of the most amazing was one was that he was a senior wrangler in the University of Cambridge. Cambridge established his name in algebraic number theory. Uh, but uh, three years ago, he switched interests and he moved from doing uh, number theory on paper to doing number theory on computers. And to do today, he will talk about formal proof verification. Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much. And thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about, yeah, as has been said already, I'm going to talk about uh, my what I've been doing over the last three years of my life. Uh, which is very different to what I was doing for the first 25 years uh, of my academic career, where I was just doing research into number theory. So here's the plan for the talk. Briefly, I mean, I'm gonna give some very, you know, how computers have changed mathematics. We all know computers have changed mathematics, uh, but in some sense, computers have also not changed mathematics. I mean, they've not changed parts of it at all. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you a, computer program. Uh, that will all happen very quickly. And then, uh, and then I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, whether these computer games will actually change mathematics. So that's where we're going. Uh, so, so have computers changed mathematics? Well, of course they have. I mean, they've completely revolutionized mathematics in lots and lots of ways. Uh, this is a way that I'm not going to talk about, you know, things like Wikipedia in the archive have hugely changed uh, the way mathematicians work. Uh, but I'm more talking about mathematicians using computers, you know, as a tool to do mathematics rather than a tool for communicating mathematics. So, of course, in applied mathematics in particular, uh, people can run simulations uh, and look for new, new phenomena. You know, they can approximate solutions and then, uh, you know, they can look at answers to 10 decimal places and have a brilliant idea and realize what's going on. And as well as that, uh, they've given us the ability to test conjectures, things like you know, the Goldback conjecture. Uh, one can really, uh, you know, one can crank through examples. You know, every even number is supposed to be the sum of two primes, every even number at least four. Uh, but you know, we now have substantial evidence, you know, this is true for a lot of this is true for a lot of even numbers. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's now a theorem that every odd number, at least seven, is the sum of three primes. And the computer was an integral part of the, you know, that's a pure mathematics theorem. Uh, but the proof of that was, you know, using, using the, the circle method, abstract, you know, number theory, to prove that every number bigger than about 10 to the 30, every odd number bigger than about 10 to the 30 is the sum of three primes. Uh, and then all the numbers less than 10 to the 30, one just checks them by computer. So they've revolutionized applied mathematics, uh, but what about pure mathematics? Well, you know, we've seen, I've just mentioned the weak Goldback conjecture, and here's another very famous uh, conjecture, the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture, arguably one of the most famous conjectures in pure mathematics. And uh, computers were an integral part uh, of the discovery of this conjecture. You know, it's, it's, you know at the end of the day, it's a, it's a conjecture about cubic equations in two variables. Uh, but the conjecture relates the number of solutions modulo a prime number. So you can count the number of solutions modulo a prime number. And also uh, you can count the number of rational solutions. The, the number of rational solutions uh, is a finitely generated abelian group. And uh, so one gets another invariant that way. And Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer, uh, the Swinnerton and Dyer in particular, did a lot of computations uh, computing the number of solutions to lots of cubic equations modulo all the primes less than 100 on a very primitive, one of these computers that was, you know, the size of a house uh, and incredibly primitive in the 1960s. I, I, I looked up some facts about this computer. It had 6,000 bits of memory. Uh, so 6,000 zeros and ones, that was its total uh, memory capacity. And the, the big advantage over it, over the EDSAC one machine, was that it could operate on all digits of a number simultaneously. It didn't just have to work with a, at the bit level, it could work 
it can somehow do calculations with several bits simultaneously, which made addition uh, much quicker. So this is obviously a very primitive machine, but Swinnerton and Dyer used it to compute, uh, you know, give, get lots of tables of data of number of solutions to two variable cubic equations, uh, modulo small prime numbers. And then they just drew graphs by hand and uh, discovered a very profound, uh, a very profound connection between the number of solutions modulo primes and the number of solutions in rationals. And, and then after a while, their, uh, their understanding of what was going on increased until the conjecture finally became uh, the conjecture we have in its current form. Uh, so that is the first example of, uh, in a brilliant article by Tom Hales called Mathematics in the Age of the Turing Machine, which talks about the influence that computers have had on mathematics and not just, uh, not just running simulations, uh, but actually inspiring us, inspiring us to spot you know, profound conjectures. And, uh, and prove theorems. It's a, it's a really great article. Uh, so, I mean, I want to get on to theorems. I mean, the, the problem is that pure mathematicians don't just state conjectures, pure mathematicians prove theorems. So 50 years after Birchins and Sunita we now have a gigantic database of, uh, of elliptic curves. We have the L functions and modular forms database. So this has got millions of elliptic curves in. Uh, and for a fair proportion of those elliptic curves, the Birch and Swinners and Dyer conjecture or some form of it uh, has been verified by computers. So extensive calculations have been done with these elliptic curves. And of course, you know, the, the, this database is an online database. People can add to it, this database grows. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, there, there are people who are interested in the Birch and Swinners and Dyer conjecture, but never look at this database uh, because compiling data on elliptic curves is never going to prove the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture. The Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture is almost certainly true. Uh, I mean, not everyone believes it's true, but the people that don't believe it true tend to be the people that have tried to prove it for decades and are now exasperated. The Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture does look like it's true. And so just computing more and more examples, there's infinitely many elliptic curves. So just computing more and more examples is not going to prove the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture. Uh, and, and it might not even give us any more. I mean, if it, if it were to find a counterexample, I would have to eat my words. Uh, but let's assume that the conjecture is true, then doing more and more computations with elliptic curves is, is almost certainly not going to prove it. Uh, and of course, this is just one example. There are many more examples of pure mathematicians out there who are trying to prove theorems like the Birch and Swinders and Dyer conjecture or, or, other, or other abstract theorems whose proof can't be done by a computer, you know, proof th theorems, which are statements about infinite sets, basically. Uh, so there are, there are pure mathematicians out there who, who really cannot use computers in their research. I mean, they either do not or, or they cannot. Uh, they, they don't see the use of them. You know, if people, are, if they want to prove a theorem rather than do a computation, prove a theorem about, for example, the set of all elliptic curves, or they're working in infinite dimensional Banach spaces or, or something. They might not even be able to model uh, the kind of objects they're thinking about uh, using a computer in the traditional sense. And uh, I indeed, I asked around in my department when I was preparing this talk, and I did find, you know, I found an algebraic number theorist in my department, Amberish Powell, who's claimed to me that he's never used a computer in his research at all. Uh, so there are plenty of mathematicians out there for whom the advent of the computer has, has really not changed the way they do their research. So there's some evidence that computers haven't changed mathematics in some sense. Uh, so now I'm gonna show you a computer program. Uh, you know, it's a toy, it's called uh, the Lean Proof Assistant. Now I think if I do that, I'm, I'm sharing this monitor, aren't I? You should be able to now see, uh, you should now be able to see some computer code, is that right? I'm just gonna assume that you can all see a, some computer code and not the PDF slides. Uh, and this is one of the problem sheets uh, for the first year undergraduate course I'm teaching. It's problem sheet two. Uh, and this is int introductory undergraduates who are specializing in mathematics. So we're teaching them things about, you know, for all X there exists a Y, we're teaching them about quantifiers. Uh, so, you know, here's, here's the questions about, you know, for all X in the empty set and there exists an X in the empty set the kind of questions that throw uh, 
that throw beginner mathematicians. His, his question four is a question about switching quantifiers. So let's, uh, let me show you this question. So the question is, true or false, is it true that for all real numbers x, there exists a real number y, such that x plus y is two? We can see it over here, you see. This is this funny little sideways t. This is computer science speak. Uh, for this is what the goal is. The goal is to prove that for every real number x, there exists a real number y, such that x plus y is two. And how do you prove something for all real numbers x? Well, you just let x be an arbitrary real number. And there's some code for this, intro x. Uh, so this is a tactic that I typed on the left here. On the left here, you'll see more and more things which you don't, you know, which you won't know about and don't understand. But on the right here, uh, we can see some very familiar things. So now, now we have x, is an arbitrary real number. This, this x colon r at the top means x is a real number. And now we have to prove there exists a real number y such that x plus y is two. Uh, and of course that's easy. We can just let y be two minus x. So let's use, uh, use two minus x. And now we've got to prove that x plus two minus x is two. And this is simple. I mean, I mean this follows from the axioms of a ring. Uh, so I can just use a high powered tactic, but I mean, I don't have to, use the axioms of a ring, this system knows the axioms of a ring and it invokes them in a sensible way. And this question is now solved. It says goals accomplished here. So that's part A of question four and part B of question four is a very similar looking question, especially if you're a first year undergraduate who's just learning about quantifiers. It says, does, the question is, does there exist a Y such that for all X, X plus Y is two? You can, again, we can see on the right here, this is the place to look. Does there exist a Y such that for all X, X plus Y is two? And a first year undergraduate might say, well, we've answered this question already. I mean, there does exist a Y because Y is two minus X. So we can use two minus X again. And then we get some error uh, because you see the exists is before the for all this time. We can't use two minus X yet because the computer doesn't know what X is. Uh, so it's hard, you see, this, this is not true, right? There doesn't exist a Y, we'd have to use you, we don't have an X, this is the problem. You can see there's no X here. Y can't depend on X because the next, the only move we can, the next move we can make, we've got to prove there exists a Y. So we're gonna to have to use, we're gonna to have to use a number like a thousand. We could use that. And now we've got to prove that for all X, X plus a thousand is two. You see, this isn't true, right? This level can't be solved. And so what the student has to do is change this true for a false. And we'll just put a not in front of it. It's not true that there exists a Y such that for all x, x plus y is two. And now this is a different level, right? This is turning maths problems into a computer game. And now, and uh, we were just trying to solve a level of this computer game that was unsolvable, like a Sudoku with numbers all in the wrong place. Uh, but we've changed this question to its negation. And now one can, again, play the computer game. One can solve this level. One can like, you know, uh, I, won't, I won't do it. One proves this by contradiction, of course. Uh, so what's happening here? Is that, uh, is that students that are confused about for all elements of the empty set, something is true. For all elements of the empty set, two plus two is five. Is that true or false? That's quite a logical conundrum really for people that are just beginning to learn this stuff. And uh, this, you know, you give it to them on a piece of paper and an average student in their first year might just like write a load of old rubbish and then somebody has to mark it. But if, if this game here, you can't write rubbish. If you write rubbish, the computer just says there's an error. And uh, once you've fixed all the errors, if you can, if you can prove this statement, uh, then, you, then you've solved that question. And I mean, and your script doesn't need marking, right? Because the computer's marked it for you. So that's an interesting toy. In fact, this is, this is a computer program called Lean. Uh, and I initially became interested in Lean because I'm very interested in teaching uh, and uh, and I was experimenting with using this as a teaching tool. So now let's go back to uh, let's go back to the talk. So I should say it's a teaching tool, but it's completely optional. If students don't want to engage with computers at this point in their education, then they don't have to. Uh, so as we've seen, uh, this toy you know can do elementary logic. Uh, which, you know, it's not really asking for much. One can Google around and find plenty of computer games on the internet uh, where, you can, where you can solve elementary logic problems. You know, there are, very, there are some very nice websites uh, with some very nice problems. You, sometimes you can solve them graphically and things like this. Uh, so what else could this particular toy do, Lean? Uh, 
Well, the one thing it's not very good at doing is computing, even though it's a computer program. I really would not want to use Lean to do the kind of things that Birch and Swindles and Dye were doing in the 1960s. I mean, it is possible uh, to use Lean to do that. You know, I, I would not want to use Lean to count the number of solutions to this equation here, y squared equals x cubed plus 37x plus 2020 20, modulo 97. It could do it, but it might be slow. I would, I would use some software that was more appropriate for the job. So what does Lean do? Lean can be used to check proofs. That's its fundamental, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the thing that it's born doing. Uh, it can check, it can check proofs. So the human types in the proof and the computer checks it to see if it's okay. And this is exactly why I wanted to use it as a teaching tool. So, uh, I mean, how much of a toy is this thing? Uh, what kind of mathematics can toys like this understand? Uh, well, of course, these systems know, these systems know the axioms of mathematics. Uh, so in theory, they could understand all of axiom, you know, all of axiom-based mathematics, which you know, is the vast majority of pure mathematics, really. Uh, but how far can they get, you know, before things grind to a halt? Uh, because as we know, some proofs are very long. Uh, so, you know, in fact, that, you know, there are famous proofs in group theory that are extremely long, often, often the longest mathematical proof known is somehow a, a, it, it can be a proof in group theory, at least historically. The, the fight Thompson proof of the odd order theorem was, was I think, kind of, you know, at, at the time, People were really shocked at the length of this proof. So how far can they get? Can they do first year undergraduate problem sheets? Well, we've seen that happening, right? But I mean, can they do third year undergraduate problem sheets? I should say there are plenty of other tools other than Lean that can do this kind of stuff. Computer proof checkers. Can they do third year undergraduate pure mathematics? Or can they do MSc level mathematics? Or uh, you know, can they do PhD level? Can they do research level pure mathematics? Can they understand questions I have about elliptic curves or modular forms that would show up in my own research or about the Langlands philosophy. So that's really what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about. You know, what, 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 what do these tools actually do in practice? And uh, here's the, the key thing. These systems are capable of learning mathematics uh, as long as we can find somebody that wants to teach them that mathematics. Uh, and so who's going to teach them? <laughs> because there's a lot of mathematics. I'm subscribed to the, I'm a number theorist. I'm subscribed to the number theory archive uh, daily email listings. And so every day in my inbox, I get 20 more uh, number theory papers. You know, that's the speed at which modern number theory seems to be moving. And uh, it would take me a lot longer than one day to type those papers into one of these systems. Uh, and of course, why should we bother, right? I mean, if a, if a, decent mathematician writes a paper that shows up on the archive and that paper i mean what's the point of checking the proofs anyway the proof you know in the in 99 of cases these proofs are uh, unproblematic and in the other one percent you know issues show up during the referee process so should we bother teaching these systems mathematics anyway you know i think that's a very a very reasonable question uh well, I mean, one natural, one natural answer is maybe if we taught these systems mathematics, uh, they might be able to help uh, the researchers that I mentioned earlier, the ones that don't need, you know, the, the ones that don't need to do brute force number crunching, uh, but who want to prove theorems. If we teach one of these systems mathematics, uh, will this system be able to help researchers that don't actually need to compute? You know, the researchers that, that want to prove abstract theorems about infinite sets for which computation might not help. So, of course, you know, as, as is clear, I'm getting to the problem, right? Research mathematicians aren't interested in toys. Uh, so Swinners and Dyer died earlier this year, and I went to his memorial service in Cambridge because, you know, the, the British number theory crowd is in some sense quite a small crowd. You know, people know each other. Uh, so I went to Swinners and Dyer's memorial service and met Birch, and I told him, I told him what I've been doing recently. And his first question about Lean was, can it tell us anything new? Right, and this is one of the really important things that one needs to stress. You know, I'm talking to an audience of research mathematicians. These systems cannot prove any new theorems right now. They cannot tell us anything new yet. I told Birch this and he somehow basically instantly lost interest. They can't tell us anything new. And this is somehow the problem, right? 
Uh, this is the catch-22. They can't tell us anything new. So research mathematicians are not really interested in these systems. As I say, I first got interested uh, not for research purposes, but for teaching purposes. These systems are not used by research mathematicians. And so nobody has the skills uh, to type research mathematics into these computers because you have to learn the system as well. You have to know research mathematics and you have to learn the system. So these systems don't learn mathematics because it's computer scientists in the main that are using them right now. And computer scientists, they, of course, they know undergraduate level mathematics, but they don't know, you know, they know some undergraduate level mathematics. And some of them know some very deep mathematics, but uh, they tend not to know the kind of mathematics which is happening in, in research math departments. If you, look at, if you look at people in Harvard who are doing research, uh, they're doing the kind of stuff that computer programmers wouldn't know a thing about. So uh, just to prove my point, here, here are some examples of proof assistance. If I was giving this talk in a computer science department, I might expect a large collection of the audience to have heard of these things. But uh, if I'm speaking to mathematicians, I would not expect people to have heard of these sort of systems. Lean, Koch, Isabel Hull, Miser, Hull Light, and Metamath. These are all systems uh, which are perfectly capable of doing mathematics, but they're limited in what they can do uh, because mathematicians don't use them which puts very strict limits on the kind of mathematics they're capable of, uh, they're capable of doing. Uh, so probably most of you have never heard of any of those things. I mean, I've been speaking about lean, but, uh, but I could e just as easily have been speaking about any of them. And then you compare this with computer algebra packages, things that can do simulations and computations, draw nice three-dimensional graphs. You know, Maple, MATLAB, Mathematica, Sage, Gap, and Parry, these are not, uh, these are not really computer languages like C or Java or Haskell or Python. Uh, these, are, these are mathematics packages. You know, we, these, these are interfaces to mathematics. These are interfaces which let humans type in mathematical ideas and uh, you know, they can be interpreted uh, by these computer programs. And you know, 3D graphs can be drawn and uh, number crunching can be done. And, and these things here, uh, you find the kind of mathematicians that do need to do compute examples, want to verify conjectures, you know, the kind of people that are interested in, uh, in, in mathematical objects which can be understood by a computer, for example, a number field, uh, you know, it can easily be, uh, can easily be stored uh, in a small finite amount of data. So many people in math departments have heard of these pieces of software, but very few of them have heard of these, uh, these proof assistance softwares, these proof checker things. So there's a huge difference between uh, these two ways of thinking about mathematics on a computer. I mean, for example, uh, it, it's very easy to give a very concrete example. A computer program like Sage or Mathematica uh, would be able to print out you know, the first thousand prime numbers or the first thousand digits of pi. But a proof assistant like Lean would be able to prove that there were infinitely many prime numbers. You see, that's a different kind of thing. Lean would be able to prove a theorem about prime numbers, but would be more reluctant to compute them. Whereas Sage or Mathematica would happily compute the first thousand prime numbers, but it doesn't really make sense to ask it to prove that there's infinitely many because these computer algebra packages aren't designed to do proofs. Uh, so if these computer proof systems uh, exist, why do they even exist? They've existed for 50 years. They've existed for a, a long time now. The first primitive ones have been around a very long time. And very serious proof assistants have existed for around 30 years. So why have computer scientists even been writing these systems uh, if no mathematicians are using them? And the answer is they were written for different reasons. They weren't actually written uh, to check mathematics. Uh, one of the initial, the main impetus with these systems is that computer scientists can use them to verify that computer code has no bugs. Uh, and verifying the computer code has no bugs is a multi-billion dollar industry. This is a gigantic thing. I mean, code runs the world. Code keeps airplanes in the sky. It keeps the lights on. Uh, you know, code, code makes the vast majority of stuff work. You know, code makes the internet work. And it's important that code has no bugs. You know, code, Buggy code costs lives. You know, my uh, uh, you know, hospitals are full of are full of computers or things with chips in. You know, something with a chip in is a computer. Hospitals are full of computers keeping patients alive. Uh, 
so verifying that code has no bugs is an important is an important story. But uh, there's this there's this phenomenon that uh, proofs are the same as computer programs. Right? If you if you're talking about certain kinds of mathematical proofs and talking about computer programs written in a certain kind of language, then those kinds of proofs are literally the same as those sorts of programs. But uh, you know, there are generalizations of this. But in some sense, a mathematical proof is very strongly related to a computer program. And so one takes the systems which are designed to check the code has no bugs. And uh, I mean, I would imagine Lean is being developed by Microsoft. And I imagine that one of the reasons they're developing it uh, is because they want to verify that computer code has no bugs. But there's this funny coincidence that they can also be used to check that proofs have no bugs. And uh, so they can be used to do mathematics. And many, many systems have been written. Uh, and uh, the, ma the mathematicians that, you know, up until recently, the mathematicians that have been playing with these things, you know, they tend to be interested in foundations. You know, they're interested in logic or, you know, type theory or category theory or set theory. Uh, and, you know, the, the foundations are tweaked a little bit, axioms are tweaked to see if one can get the systems to run faster. And uh, computer scientists use them to do mathematics. And, you know, found, you know, people interested in the foundations of mathematics also use them. Uh, but, you know, but us, us proper mathematicians, the ones interested in, you know, analysis or algebra or geometry or number theory or topology, things like that, uh, we, we, we don't use these systems at all. Uh, and my, my argument, really, having seen what they can do, my argument is that it's time that things changed. It's time that things change. So that's really the first half of the talk. And, uh, and now in the second half of the talk, you know, I, I, you know, I want to explain why I think we should start changing and, uh, you, know, how, how to, you know, how I'm going about trying to make this happen. Uh, so if you look at the kind of theorems that have been proved in these systems, somehow every, every single, like if you make an, if you write a new, com, if you write a new computer programming language, the first thing you write is a hello world a piece of hello world code. You know, you verify that, uh, you verify that uh, your, your system can print hello world on the screen. And similarly, these proof systems, they all tend to have proofs that the square root of two is irrational. And there's no rational number whose square is two. And also that there are infinitely many prime numbers. These are two very common things that you see almost, you know, to, to, test, to test these systems. Uh, but some of the systems, it's funny nowadays, some of the systems have proofs of highly non-trivial theorems. You know, these, these are just toy theorems we prove uh, with undergraduates. So let me go through the achievements of these people that I've listed here. Uh, so Jeremy Avigad and uh, Mario Carnero have both proved the prime number theorem. Jeremy Avigad proved it in Isabel Hall. Uh, he, he used the, uh, the classical proof. And uh, Mario Carnero proved it in Metamath. Uh, he, uh, he gave the, 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 uh, the Erdős Selberg proof, the, the, the so-called elementary proof. I mean, it's still very long and slightly delicate, but both proofs have been checked in one of these systems. So, you know, one could argue that this was a, you know, a reasonable, you know, a substantial mathematical theorem, but, you know, it was proved a hundred years ago. Uh, and also the proof is in some sense very elementary. I mean, we teach it, you know, we teach it to our undergraduates at my university. It's a part of the analytic number theory module. Uh, but, you know, it's something. It, it, it at least proves that one can understand large theorems. You know, these systems can scale well enough to check a large theorem. Uh, and here are two much bigger theorems. The four color theorem uh, uses some, I mean, some slightly tricky mathematics, but in some sense, low level mathematics to reduce the proof to the verification that uh, a collection of about 2000 graphs can't be colored. And uh, the original proof of this used a computer, but it used, you know, a, you know it used a computer in the, this other sense, you know, it used a programming language, wrote a program and the program could have had bugs. Uh, but the proof by Georges Gontier and a team of collaborators of this, of the four color theorem in Koch uses one of these proof checking systems. So, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about the various ways that uh, you verify that these proof checking systems are correctly checking proofs. Uh, that's not really the remit of this talk, but uh, the four color theorem has now been checked in a proof checking system. And this was one of Gontier's major achievements. And he went on 
to verify the fight Thompson odd order theorem. This is the theorem, every group of odd order uh, is solvable. And the proof of this was hundreds of pages long. Uh, but I mean, the original proof was even longer, but by about, uh, by, by about 2000, it had been compressed into two reasonably self-contained uh, monographs, two books, uh, which could be understood by someone that had a background in undergraduate level mathematics, you know, group theory and representation theory was what it used. And, uh, you know, the proof is quite funny. A lot of the, a lot of the proof is spent uh, verifying, uh, you know, proving more and more facts about a minimal counterexample. So there's hundreds of lemmas about the smallest possible counterexample to this theorem. And, uh, you know, the final lemma is that uh, such a, such a counterexample doesn't exist. So there's many, many lemmas which are in some sense now completely irrelevant, but are needed in the proof. Uh, so this was a monumental piece of work. This took a team of 12 researchers six years to do. Uh, but it does prove that, uh, you know, these theorems are capable of operating at Fields level standard, Fields medal standard. You know, part of uh, the reason Thompson got his Fields medal was for the proof of this theorem. So that was, that was all Gontier's work. Uh, so Tom Hales, uh, he proved the Kepler conjecture. The story behind that was he announced a proof and this was like four color theorem, but even worse. You know, he reduced the conjecture to, to verifying 70,000 nonlinear inequalities, uh, which, which he wrote computer code to do in, in C++. And, uh, and the referees were concerned that if there were a bug in that code, then the proof fell apart. And so again, he, he took up the challenge he sent it to the annals and after many years, the annals were still very concerned that the referees were incapable of you know, verifying the proof in full because it had a large computational component. And so he verified the entire proof using uh, the union of two systems. He used one system to prove a certain intermediate result and then assuming that result in another theorem, uh, he, finished the, he finished the proof. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is something done in uh, something done in Lean, the system I was talking about, uh, just to prove that one can do recent mathematics. Uh, you, know, we uh, we took, I mean, we the community. I mean, Xander Darman, Johannes Herzl, and Rob Lewis. Darman is a number theorist. Herzl is a computer scientist. He works at Apple now, and Rob Lewis kind of straddles both areas. Uh, he has qualifications in mathematics and philosophy and computer science, uh, and he's on the job market currently. Uh, and uh, they formalized uh, the proof of the capset conjecture that Jordan Ellenberg and uh, Ellenberg and Geisweit, they proved this a few years ago and uh, this ended up as an Annals of Maths paper. They proved a combinatorial conjecture. And uh, very shortly after this was proved, the entire proof was formalized in Lean. Uh, so I, I want to regard these as achievements, but I think again, one has to be very clear here. All these proofs are low level, right? You take Fermat's last theorem, that's a low level statement. It's a statement about natural numbers, uh, but the proof is extremely high level. It uses very high level objects. And all of these results here, they're using quite low level objects. You know, prime numbers, you, you know, the, 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 the odd order theorem is a profound statement about groups, but the proof uh, really stays well within the realms of group theory. You know, it's just lots and lots and lots of theorems about what Sulov subgroups of uh, groups of odd order look like. And you know, the Kepler conjecture, is a conjecture about spheres. Uh, these objects are in some sense low level objects. Uh, so this is evidence that uh, we can prove, you know, difficult theorems uh, about low level objects. You know, the, the, the ideas of what's brilliant, you know, the, the brilliant manipulations of, of what sets these results apart, but the objects involved are elementary. So, you know, this shows that the systems are capable of doing non-trivial things. Uh, but again, you know, the kind of person that's working in Harvard maths department is not, it tends not to be thinking about low level objects. You know, they might be thinking about perfectoid spaces or Shimura varieties or, you know, flows on manifolds, you know, rather, rather more complex things. So what do these systems offer mathematicians? I mean, currently I've argued that they offer very little. And in fact, I think computer scientists have done a very poor job of advertising the systems to mathematicians. And so this is, I'm, I'm taking their place now. I'm a mathematician attempting to advertise these systems to mathematicians because I really think that they can change mathematics. Uh, so why do I think that? I mean, firstly, we can look at, they might've been around for 50 years, but let's look at where they are currently and where they could be. How many of these systems 
I've got all the pure mathematics in the standard pure mathematics undergraduate curriculum. And the answer is easy, is none of them. I mean, none of them have even got the proof that the class group of a number field is finite. I mean, this was a result that was in some sense known to Gauss. You know, Gauss had some, you know, Gauss understood the class group of an imaginary quadratic field. And now, you know, this, this is a standard result in my third year undergraduate number theory class. You know, I, I define the class group of a number field and then I prove that the class group of a number field is finite. How many of them have that proof? None of them. And how many ha even have the statement? And the answer is none of them because none of them even know what the class group of a number field is. You see, this is, this is ridiculous. They've been around for decades, but they're not being used by mathematicians. And so mathematicians haven't ever told any of these systems this statement. They've not even bothered to tell them what the class group of a number field is. So this is kind of ridiculous because on the other side of the fence, we have these AI people at Google who are you know, absolutely convinced uh, that these systems could change mathematics. And you know, people, people who work at Google think that computers will be proving new theorems. I, I'm skeptical, I must say, I'm skeptical. But I've met serious people at Google, Christian Zegedy. You know, this, is, this is a guy who's, you know, who has papers with 10,000 citations. Christian Zegedy, he's, he's done some really profound things. But he's told me that he thinks within 10 years, we'll have computers proving theorems that humans can't prove. I mean, I'm skeptical, but he's no fool, but he needs, he needs a database, right? He wants to train his AI on a database and this database doesn't exist. Where is the database you know, of modern theorems in algebraic geometry? Well, the answer is it's nowhere because nobody who does algebraic geometry knows how to use these systems, or at least that was true a couple of years ago. Nobody. The intersection of the people who know enough algebraic geometry to read the stacks projects and know enough about computer systems to actually interact with one of these systems, the intersection is zero people. Uh, so, and as it happens, within a few weeks, we will be able to state at least uh, the main theorems from my number theory classes in Lean because I have a team of people working on this stuff, right? I've got a team and where is that team? It's not the staff. You see, because we don't need the staff right now. We don't need to do hard algebraic geometry. We've still got a gaping hole in these libraries, in every single library, in every one of these systems. We have a gaping hole. Undergraduate mathematics is not there, right? Undergraduates of my university are getting interested. I mean, let me let me just go back. So let me find let me find quadratic reciprocity. If I search for this uh, quadratic reciprocity, oh, let me. Uh, Oh, let me do that. There we go. Here's the quadratic reciprocity file. Uh, here is, you know, I'm not expecting you to follow this. I mean, there's lots of useful comments at the beginning. Uh, and one can understand the statements of these theorems. You know, there's the, the lemma is called Euler's criterion. You know, A has a square root mod P if and only if A to the P minus one over two is one. It says P over two, but that's because, you know, this is integer division with a, you know, remainder is forgotten blah, 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 blah. You know, all of this looks incomprehensible. We can, we can click, you know, the, the stuff on the right is sometimes comprehensible. The stuff on the left is completely incomprehensible, you know, to a mathematical researcher. You know, these, these proofs are long. Gauss lemma orcs, Gauss lemma, Eisenstein lemma orcs, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and somewhere in here uh, is gonna be quadratic reciprocity and its consequences. There's the, the Legendre symbol. We'll define, you know, it's, it's zero if a, is, if a is zero mod p, it's one if a is a square mod p, and minus one otherwise. And uh, there's the proof of Gauss's lemma. There's, you know, there's Eisenstein's criterion. There's the proof of quadratic reciprocity. It's very short after all this work. And here's the supplements for the prime two. So, you know, who has written all this? You know, is this some professor of computer science has written all of this? No, it's an undergraduate at my university. Second year undergraduate wrote this because I taught them I taught them the language. And now they're just kind of going to their classes and they see interesting proofs and they type it up and they stick it in the maths library. So we have a big, Lean has a big maths library and a non-trivial proportion of it is written by undergraduates at my university who are just formalizing stuff that they see in their undergraduate lectures. So, you know, of course I've got bigger plans really. It's not just about formalizing undergraduate mathematics, but I think that has to be where we start. So here's the plan. Firstly, let's teach a pure mathematics curriculum to one of these systems, and I choose Lean. Uh, 
So things are progressing, right? So here's, here's the kind of thing. So four years ago, we had nothing. Uh, four years ago, we, in fact, let me show you, let me show you this uh, graph here. This is, a, this is some statistics on Lean's maths library. So it was born in August, 2017, about the time, coincidentally, the time I arrived on the scene. Uh, and there it was, you know, it was uh, some, some, what's this scale here? This must be hundreds of, oh, this is number of files. That's, where's number of lines of code here? So it started off as about 20,000 lines of code. It was all constructive mathematics, you know, not classical mathematics. It was mostly theorems about finite sets. And uh, you can see what's just happened here as more and more people have got involved. And the, and the, light, and the, it, the graph accelerates here because of lockdown. Uh, lockdown, I mean, lockdown has been terrible for a lot of people. I mean, maybe you didn't even have a lockdown in the US, but uh, in many countries in Europe, people were just locked down and had to remain in their homes unless they went, unless they needed food. Uh, and you can see there's this clear, there's this clear jump in the derivative here. Uh, so now we have 400,000 lines of code and it's growing fast. Uh, so so things, are, things are happening very quickly. And what's the kind of things we do have? Well, as I say, to a large extent, we're concentrating on undergraduate mathematics. So here's, here's you know, things, things we've got, groups, rings, fields, you know, basic second year algebra, localizations of rings. I got a first year undergraduate to do that. They learned localizations of rings uh, by, uh, by formalizing you know, the theorems in a theorem McDonald in Lean. Uh, there's a lot of category theory. Uh, we don't have any representation theory. We don't have, you know, we don't, uh, but you know, it's getting there, it's slowly appearing. Number theory, we have very little, which is a bit surprising given that I'm a number theorist, but I've been concentrating on other things. You know, so we have, we have the results in the elementary number theory course, uh, but we don't have anything about number fields, but uh, actually I have a PhD student who's just started working on number fields. She's, uh, she's been formalizing the theory of Dedekind domains and discrete valuation things. So geometry, metric and topological spaces, the manifolds were very hard to put. The, the actual formal definition of a manifold from the axioms of mathematics is extremely complicated. And there's several definitions in the literature because the, you know, there are all sorts of issues about you know, maximal chart. You know, the, the issue is, do you, do you just cover the manifold or do you take some maximal, you know, some maximal cover with, it's, it's, it's a subtle thing, but we have enough, we've built enough to be able to make things like tangent spaces which was you know, a test to see if the system was working. Uh, but you know, we, we have zero theorems about compact Riemann surfaces. I want to prove theorems about modular forms, but before I can start on that, I would really like a, a working theory of compact Riemann surfaces. Uh, and it's not there yet. In fact, complex analysis is generally very weak. For real analysis, we're doing very well. We have a, a theory of derivatives and a theory of integrals. We have a lot of measure theory a Borel measure and Lebesgue measure, and even Haar measure recently for some arbitrary uh, locally packed, locally compact, uh, uh, yeah, Hausdorff topological abelian group. Uh, we re very recently proved the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, but we don't have any complex integrals. We can't integrate, we can't integrate one over Z around the unit circle yet, uh, because no one has put in the definition of a contour integral. I mean, these things will come ask me again in one year and we will have that, you know, because, a lot of this appeared in the last year or two. You know, the, the progress is fast. This is just a snapshot as to where we are. You know, uh, I, I have this talk, I've used this talk in several slides and every time I use it again, I have to add something else. I added Haar measure uh, for this talk. Haar measure didn't, ex you know, Haar measure is just, I think a month, a month old now. So four years ago, there was nothing, you see. So at least there's some kind of measure of the progress, uh, the progress we've made. Uh, so how are undergraduates learning this stuff? Well, I just run a club, you know, I teach them. All it takes is one staff member at one, one enthusiastic staff member at a university. And then all of a sudden you can have 10 undergraduates uh, who know it. And of course, once you've got 10 undergraduates interested, they can start, you know, teaching each other. And, you know, books are appearing. I'm in the middle of writing a, an instructional textbook for mathematicians. Another one of the problems is that the textbooks for this software tend to be very much focused on computer scientists. They're written by computer scientists for computer scientists. I'm trying to write a book by mathematicians for mathematicians. Uh, it's in progress. I mean, it's online. You can read its current state. It's called Mathematics in Lean. Uh, 
So once we've done step one, once we have an undergraduate curriculum, and you know, give us another give, an, give us another two years, we will have an undergraduate curriculum. I'm absolutely convinced of this. That just the rate at which things are happening. Uh, so step two was more, and this really, this was the reason uh, that I got interested. That I realised that the system was worth taking seriously. I thought, you know, why don't we define perfectoid spaces? Because we knew, you know, every number theorist knew that Schultz was going to get a Fields Medal for his work on perfectoid spaces. And the very definition of a perfectoid space is extremely complex. You know, to, to even define adic spaces, one has to prove you know, a lot of very delicate theorems about topological rings. The, the topology on an adic space is quite a subtle thing. Uh, so to stress test it, we, we you know, me and uh, two collaborators, two other math, these are also mathematicians. Masso is an analyst in Orsay, and Comelan is a postdoc. Uh, he's another arithmetic geometer in Freiburg. Uh, and the three of us worked together uh, to formalize perfectoid spaces. And it took us eight months, you know, because we had to develop, we had to develop, for example, the theory of topological rings from first principles and prove all the universal properties. We had to do a vast amount of preliminary work. Uh, but we defined perfectoid spaces in the end, you know, 18,000 lines of code. And, and once I realized we could do that, I realized that. You know, now this is a data point of a very different nature. I mean, we can prove the odd order theorem in these systems, but that's a very long and complicated proof about very simple objects. You know, here we're getting proofs, you know, we were proving theorems about complex objects, but we don't prove deep theorems. We don't, we don't get Schultz's Fields Medal yet. Uh, we, you know, we can, we can prove trivial things. You know, we proved that the empty set was a perfectoid space. Uh, but to prove deep theorems about perfectoid spaces, this is, you know, we, we still need far more machinery. You know, we've, we've only very recently got algebraic closures. You know, we can only, for those of you that know about perfectoid spaces, you, one takes, you know, things like the, you take the p-adic numbers and then you take the algebraic closure and then the p-adic completion of this thing here. And this is an algebraically closed field. But I mean, these, these are the kind of theorems we still get to prove. You know, we can, we can define algebraic closures and completions, but uh, things like, you know, the completion of a, of a certain kind of topological field is still a field. I mean, this is a theorem, this is in ball backing. Uh, but as I say, this is what convinced me that these systems were actually worth considering using. And so now I, I teach, you know, I teach uh, MSc students to use this stuff. I, I, I give an MSc student a relatively straightforward MSc level problem, not something difficult. Uh, and I see if they can teach MSc level mathematics to lean. And we've had great success. You know, we've, we've built things like group cohomology and schemes. These have all come out of, uh, MSc projects, which I've supervised. Uh, so I'm just winding up now. So as I say, there are many of these systems. So why, uh, why lean? Uh, why is it different to, uh, why is it different to these other systems? I mean, in some sense, it's not different, but actually in, in some important subtle senses, it is different. I mean, one reason is it's backed by Microsoft uh, who have been extremely receptive uh, they're currently, I, I, the thing I showed you was Lean 3. They're currently writing Lean 4. It's almost ready for release. And uh, the developers have been extremely receptive uh, to the questions and comments which have been raised uh, by mathematicians. Uh, it's being used by mathematicians. As I say, for example, me and Masso and Comelan, we're just we are fully paid up mathematicians working in maths departments. And there are more of us and the collection of us is growing. Uh, and as a consequence, it's being pushed in different ways. You know, people are, people are trying to make mathematical definitions that these systems have never seen before. Things like class groups and manifolds, I've mentioned these before. These are just not in these systems because the other systems are not really used by research mathematicians. And it's as a result of being pushed in new directions, you know, we find we run into interesting questions and run into interesting problems. And we report back to Microsoft and Microsoft, you know, changes their development of, their, of these systems so that we won't have these problems in Lean 4. You know, there's an extremely good interaction going on, synergy between mathematicians and computer scientists here. And uh, one really, really important fact is that there's a 24 seven helpline. You know, if one of you wants to go away and try tinkering with this system, then guaranteed you will get stuck very quickly if you don't have a mentor, but you ask a question on the helpline and somebody will get back to you typically within minutes. Uh, it's an extremely, fruitful and productive chat room. It's, it's a very serious chat room. Uh, you know, experts, experts hang around and do research there. Uh, it, it's taken, I mean, for example, there was, there was no, 
you know, just to give you an example of what this chat, this helpline looks like, it's a chat room really, but for example, there was no talk at all about the US elections, despite the fact that Americans, you know, it's pl there's plenty of Americans there, or people who live in America, but uh, it's a very much on topic focused thing. Real names are preferred and uh, focused lean conversation is also preferred. So where's this really going? Can we use these tools to teach? I'm not gonna talk about that here, but I think we can. I'm trying to figure out the best way to do that. Can we use these tools to get better search? I think we can. If you, if you want to know whether a complicated math theorem is proved already, if you type it into Google, it's probably not going to work. Right? Google will find you some math overflow page that contains the closest approximation to your theorem. Whereas if you actually are interested in specifically the theorem you're asking, uh, we don't really have a system yet that can search for that theorem. But do you know what? If this database got bigger, if I could persuade people to start formalizing just the statements of their theorems, then we could just make a big graph. You know, we could have another, uh, we could have a math sci net, but for, you know, instead of an instead of formalize, you know, instead of writing an abstract, uh, one could just state the main theorems in the paper and just put them in the database. You don't have to prove them, just state them. And of course, these AI people are extremely good at search. So if, if you've got something which is a trivial consequence of two theorems in the literature, then search nowadays can find that kind of thing. So Tom Hales is, is pushing for people to do that. He's developing a controlled natural language uh, where humans should be able to start you know, having an easier interface with the system, with, with Lean. He's doing it in Lean. And uh, if I can make it so that you know, research mathematicians have an easier interfa interface, then that will be a big step forward. Uh, but of course, before, before people could start formalizing their theorem statements, we need, to, we need to put in a lot more definitions because we don't have, you know, we don't have the class group of a number thing. We will have very soon. And uh, so, you know, can we make tools? Can we, can we make a, a beginning graduate student? You know, I, I think we can. So Scott Morrison at Australian National University, he's thinking about this. He's, he's taught in a lot of category theory. And uh, one of his successes about a year ago uh, he told Lean the statement of the Yane dilemma and, uh, and then asked Lean to go away and find a proof. And this is very much a follow your notes. I mean, the hard part of the Yane dilemma, uh, you know, it's a fundamental result in category theory, but the hard part is spotting that it's true. Uh, and he told the computer that it was true and asked the computer to find the proof and the computer found a proof. So, you know, there's a data point. Uh, so we're, you know, we're working on this. But the AI researchers are desperate. They're absolutely convinced they could do a thousand times better than the Yane dilemma, but they want to know what we know already. Uh, so, you know, let me finish just by mentioning the Sachs project. It's thousands of pages of algebraic geometry, the vast majority of which were written by Johan de Jong at MIT. Uh, oh, it's Columbia, sorry, Columbia now. And when he started it, he was at MIT, and now he's moved to Columbia. Uh, and it's thousands of pages written in human language, but, but the AI people haven't cracked natural language yet. So computers can't understand what he's writing. You know, it's very, very clearly written algebraic geometry. It's like Bourbaki, you know, very, very basic mathematics explained very clearly, but in human language. And my opinion now is he's, he's chosen the wrong thing. He should have done it in Lean, but he didn't do it in Lean. And so now we have to fix it. So now we're porting, porting statements and proofs of the Sachs project into Lean. And, uh, and it's slow going because the number of people in the world who are qualified to do that job is still very, very small, but it's a lot bigger than it was, you see. And as time goes on, uh, this number will increase. Uh, you know, th really, this is the only way that I can see that we can make a database. I mean, if we crack natural language, maybe that's something else. You know, and I'm always reminded, it's really Johan and a small team of collaborators that have made the Stacks project. It's taken them 15 years. Well, I've got 15 years of research left in me. I would quite happily spend those 15 years, you know, trying to formalize the Stacks project. I mean, I might never catch up with Johan, but if I can get other people doing it too, then maybe we can catch up. And if we make that big algebraic geometry database, will we get better search? I mean, yes, but will we get computers proving theorems in algebraic geometry? The answer to that is nobody knows. Different people have radically different opinions. Nobody knows what will happen if we teach a computer the statements of modern algebraic geometry. Uh, so that's it, really. The last slide is just an advert. You know, I, I write a blog for undergraduates. Uh, if you're interested in getting into Lean, you can start playing something called the natural number game. And uh, you know, both me and Microsoft Research are on Twitter. 
uh, and I occasionally give updates as to the kind of thing, uh, the kind of thing that's happening in Lean's maths library. And also, I run, um, you know, I run an undergraduate club that runs on a Discord server. And if any of you know any undergraduates who might be interested, uh, you know, then let me know. Because I think the, I, the, you know, the staff are currently inaccessible right now. But if I train the undergraduates, then maybe the staff in twenty years will be more open to the idea of formalizing mathematics on the computer. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Do you have any questions from the audience? With yourself and ask if you have. Yeah, uh, Kevin. Uh, hi. Yeah, hi. Yeah, great talk. Uh, oh, hi. hi. <laughs> right. yeah. it's, it, I can't see you, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming this is Mike. This is, this is Mike, yeah. Hi. Mike, I can see you. Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah. So let me let me make a couple of comments. I mean, one is based on what I think is the <clears throat> unrealistically conservative assumption that the technology kind of stays where it's at, and uh, it would be to say that uh, in the short term, I, I think the thing that could make the biggest difference in terms of the interest in mathematicians using this would be to make the uh, proofs more, you know, the, 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 you know say, let's talk about lean, make, to make the proofs more readable because uh, mathematicians- because Look at this. <laughs> do things other than uh, prove new, new theorems, you know, they, they write textbooks, they, you know, of course they teach and they do many things. And I think if one could make a system where the uh, result was as readable as a standard textbook, and uh, formally uh, verifiable, I think you would get a lot of uh, customers just to uh, write these uh, textbooks. And but would you be happy if I just put comments in every line? Maybe, whatever, you know, that's right. It may just be a, a question of how you use the system. That's right. It may be, uh, you know, or, or maybe controlled natural language, but it, 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 it probably could be much better even given the uh, tools we have. And uh, so- yeah, I, we're, not, we're not currently really attempting to do that. Right, right. And I, I think that, and that's what that's exactly your point. Right. Why not? <laughs> and uh, so so then on the uh, somewhat longer term, again, assuming this unrealistically conservative, you know, idea, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 you have to consider a time scale because, of course, you could make the analogy. This is like uh, Bourbaki 2.0, you know, the, right. You know, we we you know here's this much higher level of formal precision, and how long did it take Bourbaki to make an impact? I think decades. You know, both to you know write their books and to you know actually make an impact. Yeah. yeah. So that's the time scale. If if the if the things were to stay as they were, but you know, of course, uh, you know, you you and I, we all we all think things are going to advance uh, much more quickly, and that the, the systems ten years from now will be far more you know, capable and easy to use than what we have now. Well, I mean, let me just uh, add to that, you know, commenting on your, uh, your, 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 your last point, you know, that, that we actually are kind of, we have a, a group here which is tooling up to work on just the sort of thing you said of how would you take a big graph of mathematical knowledge and uh, work with it, you know, what is the technologies are already existing for knowledge graphs? How would you uh, put formal knowledge or, you know, combine it with, uh, you know, human knowledge and a knowledge graph for things like search engines. So it would be uh, fun to talk more about that. Yeah, this is, of course, something I know very little about with my background as a pure mathematician, but I'm well aware that there are a whole lot of smart people that know a whole lot of things about that kind of question. Thanks, Mike. Any more questions, comments? Kevin, while people are, are uh, thinking, uh, a quick question for me. Uh, if uh, in five years, say, a new generation of uh, like Lean will appear, how easy is going to be to port the code that you guys have accumulated into a completely new system? So. Lean three to lean four, that's a, I mean, again, this is not something I know too not much even. about, but here's what I've been told. Uh, there's, there's already a tool that, that 
I mean, the syntax change, right? Things are not backwards compatible. We can't just use the code as is. Uh, but the guy that's written the lean4 parser has a tool which takes lean3 code as input and outputs you know, syntactically valid lean4 code. Uh, so that is the first thing. But the, the big problem uh, is that although it will be syntactically valid, it won't work because we will have to, there, there are certain tools that we use fundamentally that are written in C++, not in Lean. The, the Lean stuff which is written in Lean, we're kind of cautiously optimistic that uh, you know, it, it will need to be tinkered with, but uh, that, you know, apparently preliminary tests have shown that this is, you know, it's not too pessimistic to think that there'll be a big machine translation and much of it will work. But the big problem is that things like we have, that Lean has a simplifier, which is written in C++. And so any proof which uses the simplifier, which is many of the proofs, I mean, we're going to have to write an analogous simplifier. There'll be more code that will need to be written uh, to cover all of the... Uh... I mean, we don't, we don't know is the short answer. But we've been told by Microsoft that preliminary experiments have indicated that things are going to go smoothly, apart from the fact that people are going to have to write some tools uh, to, to replace tactics which are written in C++. A lot of Lean 4 is written in Lean, so we're going to have to write a Lean simplifier in Lean. Uh, but this is, again, beyond my... Computer scientists are optimistic. I don't really have an informed opinion. I'm just you know, enthusiastic and hopeful. But uh, it, will have to, it will all have to be moved over because we're desperate for the extra functionality that it brings. For example, note, we'll be able to use a, notation is already powerful in Lean 3. You know, we can use Unicode characters and things like this, which is another thing that sets it apart from the other systems. It looks much more like mathematics, uh, but we'll have a much more powerful syntax. It will look even more like mathematics in Lean 4, which I think is another reason. You know, currently it looks scary, right? This is, this is one of the problems. It just looks slightly intimidating. And Mike's already raised that point. So we, we do need to port it to make it look, look less intimidating. But we'll just have to wait and see. And it's going to be even harder if, uh, at some point uh, to compete with Microsoft, Google, or say Alibaba will release their own theorem prover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Using completely different principles. Sure, sure, sure. But uh, I, I think I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying that lean is the future of mathematics, but I am arguing that, uh, that software such as lean will be part of the future of mathematics. I think that's just inevitable. If we digitize mathematics, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change things. It's gonna, you know, we'll be able to use mathematics in different ways. Just, you know, like we digitize music and now we have Spotify which certainly changed the lives of my children. Uh, we digitize mathematics, it will become usable in different ways. But if Lean just becomes dominated by some other system, if people have other ideas, then yeah, I mean, this is just all a test, really. I'm not saying let's do undergraduate mathematics, then let's do everything. I'm just saying, look, they can do undergraduate mathematics. Look, they can do lots of things. Let's see how far we can push it. It's gonna run into problems with infinity categories, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure it is because because of some technical issue with the foundations. And if, you know, so what do we do? Either we ignore infinity categories or we work around the issues. We'll get clunky code that will just about work. I mean, these things are Turing complete. So we can do infinity categories. It's just that we can't do them in the way that we want to do them. Uh, and Lean4 won't fix that. So if another system comes along, which does them much better, I mean, you know, Voivodsky's system does infinity categories much better, but unfortunately, Voivodsky's system has got many other problems. It has problems with equality, which is a much more fundamental problem. You know, Voivodsky never managed to do schemes, and we did schemes in a period of you know just a few weeks. Yeah, so who knows which system will dominate? Uh, or, there is or a try to question in chat. Uh, there's chat. Okay. Oh. Question about uh, commodity type theory. Um, right, I'm finding my way. Let's look at the chat. Uh, I am so far. 
I can read it to you. So a question from Zonglin Zhang. What kind of type system is Lin using? The homotypy type theory community is all streaming of computer uh, verifiable proofs. Is this related to the Lean project? Uh, so, okay, I see it now. Uh, so it's not using homotopy type theory. It's Lean uses something called dependent type theory. Uh, and in my mind, one of the, you know, this is one of the most interesting, interesting open problem, uh, which is, you know, which is best, which is best for all of mathematics. So, in, so m many of us were brought up in set theory, you know, and the idea, a set is just a collection of stuff. And then we build mathematics on top of that, you know, a group is a set with some structure and some axioms. Uh, but uh, many of these more successful systems, Metamath, I mentioned Metamath earlier. That's a system uh, which has a proof of the um, prime number theorem. So it's clearly a usable system for mathematics, uh, but it's a set theory system and it doesn't have any tactics. Every, every proof is sort of by hand from the axioms of mathematics and the theorems we know already. And I don't know if this is a coincidence, but the type theory theorems tend to be the ones where automation is much more powerful. So, for example, if you want to prove that x cubed, if in, if you want to prove that x cubed plus, you know, x add y all cubed is x cubed plus three x squared y plus three x y squared plus y cubed. If you wanted to prove that in metamath, you're either going to have to kind of invoke the binomial theorem, uh, or or you're going to have to expand out the brackets using the axioms of a ring. And uh, in lean, there's just a tactic that does it. You type the ring tactic, and it solves it. So the type theory. The type theory systems tend to be dominating the set theory systems in terms of efficiency of code writing. But then you've got these two kinds of type theory. You've got simple type theory, which is problematic because it won't even understand things like sheaves on a topological space. And then you've got dependent type theory and homotopy type theory. And homotopy type theory says that a type is really a, a space. But, you know, a what is a type? In, in dependent type theory, a type is like a set. You know, a type is a collection of stuff. In homotopy type theory, a type is a topological space up to homotopy equivalence. You know, topological space up to homotopy. And, uh, and, so it's, and so now you have to build sets on top of that. And somehow Wojewodski spent a lot of time trying to do homotopy theory in homotopy type theory. And indeed, it looks like this is going to be a, a possible thing. But how do you do basic number theory? I mean, one of his last papers, Wojewodski's, was a, was a, a, a pitiful construction of the periodic numbers as a field. Uh, you know, his, the system he's using was constructive, so everything has to be you know, constructive and computable, which is a disaster as far as, far as mathematics is concerned. Uh, and he constructed the periodic numbers with two other people as a field without even the topology on it, because they are problems handling topology. You know, the, the spectrum of a ring is a problematic thing because you need the law of the excluded middle to put a topology on it. Which, which is just the law of the excluded middle is an axiom of maths as far as I'm concerned, but it wasn't an axiom in Voivodska's system. So th this is, this is problem. So homotopy type theory can do some things very well, but I believe that lean can do all things reasonably well. This, this is some other point. You, 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 you can't just have a system that does a bit of maths. I think we need a system that can do all of maths before it can be taken seriously. And lean, it looks to me like lean can cover all of the standard mathematics being done in a mathematics department. It's capable of doing it. And I'm not convinced that the homotopy type theory systems are. Uh, but, but I might be wrong. You know, we need a homotopy type theory version of me, you know, a, a regular working mathematician that comes into this area and uh, you know, accepts that the law of the excluded middle is an axiom of mathematics and that constructive mathematics has its limitations. And Wojewodski didn't do that. So. You know, I, I, I think dependent type theory is a, is a better bet than homotopy type theory. And the evidence is we've got an awfully long way. You know, we've got much further than any other system in just doing undergraduate level mathematics. But, uh, you know, but I think it's still an open problem. And if somebody wants to prove me wrong, I'd be extremely happy to be proved wrong. You know, if they can make homotopy type theory work, that would be great. Any more, perhaps one last question. Okay, looks like uh, we do not have any more 
questions, uh, then uh, let us conclude the colloquium. Thank you very much, Kevin. It was a very exciting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.